All right. So welcome to our webinar series on open science for the discoverability of African research. My name is Ebuka Izike, the project manager for Africa Archive. So Africa Archive is a community-led digital archive for African research communication. By enhancing the visibility of African research, we enable discoverability and collaboration opportunities for African scientists on the continent as well as globally. This webinar series is co-organized by Ubuntu Net Alliance and Access to Perspectives as part of Africa Archive's activities for the ORCID Global Participation Program. So ORCID is the persistent identifier for researchers to share the accomplishments, that is, research articles, data, ETC, with funding agencies, publishers, data repositories, and other research workflows. So today we welcome Alison Lister as our speaker. So Alison is the Fair Sharing Content and Community Lead at the University of Oxford. So with a background in data standardization, ontologies, semantic data and integration, she is responsible for fair sharing content, as well as for the collaborations with users and outreach across all research domains. So fair sharing is a curated, informative and educational resource on data and metadata standards interrelated to databases and data policies across all disciplines. So we'll hear what documentation, fair sharing holds for African research standards, databases, and more. Again, a very warm welcome, and over to you, Alison. Thank you, Buka. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity mm -hmm. to talk with you all today. And I'm going to touch on a lot of different aspects of fair and fair sharing. So. Um, if there's anything that's unclear or anything that you have questions about, I'll try to keep an eye on the chat window. If I don't see it, apologies. It's just because when I share screens, often it can be harder to see the uh, the chat window. So I'm just going to share the screen now. All right, so you should be able to see the screen. Is that looking okay? Yes, it looks okay. Thank you, Abuka. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, so as as uh, thank you for the lovely introduction. As Abuka yeah. said, I am running the data content and the community outreach aspects of fair sharing, which is a project based at the University of Oxford. And there's another colleague of mine who runs the technical side, and I'm more than willing to take technical questions, but I may or may not be able to answer them. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit first about uh, the sort of questions that we try to help you answer in fair sharing. So if you're a research data management professional, if you're a librarian, which I know some of you are today, if you're a data steward, uh, if you're a researcher even, um, and all the way up to a policymaker level, are you a research performing organization? Are you are you a, um, a, a, a funder who is creating data policies for their fundees? Um, how, can, how can you guide your researchers to the standards and databases that they need for their research area? Um, if you're a database developer, how do you increase the findability of your database and discover new opportunities for collaboration? And the same could be said if you're developing a standard or even the data policy that you're writing itself. Well, this is where fair sharing come in, comes in. Fair sharing enables the fair and, fair and open data by trying to aid findability and interoperability um, of standards, databases, and policies. And this is deliberately uh, language that aligns with the fair principles because Although we don't store data itself in fair sharing, what we do is we try to enable fair data by connecting the producers of the data with the resources they need to make their data fair, okay? So 
Before I get started on fair sharing itself, I'm going to go into a very, very lightweight overview of fair and care because they are relevant to everyone's uh, research life and they are relevant to the fair sharing project itself. So this is the original article on the fair principles. It's actually a lot shorter than I had thought. When I first read it, it, it really says what it wants, writes a table, and then that's, that's the end of it. There's not a whole lot of discussion. And so ever since that paper was published, there's a lot of surrounding work on training material, on blog posts, on Galaxy, um, Galaxy documentation, on um, uh, software that's about interpreting the FAIR principles. And sometimes that can be a little tricky. There's so much out there to read. But what is what are the FAIR principles at their heart? Well, they're designed simply to enhance the value of any digital object in the, along the entire research uh, data life cycle and its reuse by both humans and machines. And this is important. It's not just about human readability. It's as much about machine readability. So here are the um, expanded acronym for FAIR. We have findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And it's important to remember that these are principles. They're not a standard in themselves. They're just guidance. They're almost a continuum. You're not either fair or unfair. You can be on a journey towards fair and have varying degrees of fairness according to what your research area and what your particular digital object is. Um, and its purpose originally was to create a dialogue between researchers and policymakers, but it's really gone beyond, beyond these two stakeholder groups. A lot of people think that fair and open are almost the same, but they're not. And it's really important to understand that you can make your data fair, even if it's sensitive, behind an ethics committee, behind a paywall even. Uh, you can still be fair, even if you're not open. And sometimes, of course, there are very good reasons why your data can't be open. So, of course, the greatest potential reuse comes when data are both fair and open. open. And this <laughs> very um, complicated Venn diagram here is just showing that in a graphical way. I did borrow this slide from someone I know called uh, Sarah Jones, who at the time was with the Digital Curation Center but it's just a lovely um, conceptualization of how you don't have to be both, but it's great if you can be. Over time, although the FAIR principles were originally intended to talk about research data, everyone has realized that actually it goes beyond this and it's much more important to consider all digital objects produced as outputs of, of a research project. And so there have been papers on making training materials fair, on making research software fair, on almost any digital object that can be associated with the research data lifecycle. And as I said before, there was this original idea it would enhance, um, enhance communication between researchers and policymakers. But in fact, every single aspect of research data and research data roles are involved in fair and uh, where there are varying levels to which they are involved. So on an organizational level, on a project level, on an individual researcher level, there are lots of ways you can help make FAIR. I have left this in because there's lots of links you can follow and you'll have the slides afterwards. It's a pointer to various locations where you can find extra information about FAIR, but there's a lot of stuff out there. Um, in particular, our group also produces the FAIR cookbook, which are practical instructions in the style of recipes to help you implement FAIR. Let's just see. I just thought I, oh, here we go. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on care because I'm not an expert on it, but I do know that the people who have developed care developed it in, um, in to work integrated with the FAIR principles. And so uh, there's been a lot of interesting work around working with CARE and working with CARE and FAIR together. And so I've put some of the articles that I've been reading recently up here, again, just for your own information and absolutely um, feel free to ask me questions, but that's not where I've spent most of my time. One of the things actually that I noticed when I was researching this slide is that I, while I feel 
that fair sharing itself aligns with fair in lots of different ways and also helps researchers be fair. I think there's a gap in our project where we need to um, more explicitly describe how we align with care. And so if as a result of this, um, this presentation, anyone who knows a lot about care would like to get in touch. There's lots of ways we can collaborate and I, we can attribute you for any of your work to, to do a little bit more work around showcasing, either showcasing how fair sharing aligns with care or maybe working on making sure it aligns more closely. So now let's move away from fair and care and into what fair sharing is. It's a way that you can find standards, databases, and policies and explore the connections among them. It's these connections that I love a lot and we'll come back to it a few times in the presentation. You can also add your resources of those types to fair sharing to increase their visibility within that research landscape. So this is a sort of graphical depiction of those standards, databases, and policies that I just talked about. So we provide curated descriptions of these resources as well as relationship graphs. And so what we'll do is we'll have relationships such as a database implements these particular standards or a policy recommends the use of these databases and standards. And in that way, we create a, a, a graphical overview of the research landscape around these resources. This is just a slide that talks about our stakeholder groups. They're very similar to the stakeholder groups that you would saw a few slides ago when I was talking about FAIR. And what we like to do is not just work on our registry and ensure that it's all curated as much as it can be, but also engage on a, um, on a, on a, in a sort of a deeper level with our stakeholders across all research areas, across the entire research data lifecycle. So we have people who consume fair sharing, that is they come to find a resource that they need and then they go away again once they've found it and that's perfect. We also have producers who have a more long-term relationship with us, but still one that doesn't take very long to actually engage with and you don't spend that much time. So it's a really low effort, high value um, engagement. These are producers of standards, databases and policies who come to describe their resource with us. And we also provide both humans and tools access to this content. So all of the metadata that we curate in fair sharing is accessible through our API and of course through our human accessible search engines. We have just over 4,000 records. I think this is a few weeks old, so we might have a few more here. We have oh, nearly 1,300 people in our user community who wor have worked with us. So these are people who are the owners of these resources. Who, who own also the record with us and can make edits anytime. These are our in-house curation team. These are also our community champions who are a volunteer network of domain experts who come and help contribute to fair sharing. And I'll talk a bit more about them later. You'll notice that the discipline count on the right is far higher than the record count. That's because we often tag our records with more than one discipline tag. And so, but it gives you an idea that we do mostly have natural sciences. That is an indication that we started life as a resource for the life sciences, but we have very quickly gone beyond the life sciences. We also work a lot, as I say, I, my part of my job is community outreach and I work with a lot of different types of stakeholders to make sure what we're providing to them is something that's useful to them. So these are policymakers, their funders, their research infrastructures, their volunteer organizations like the Research Data Alliance, they are um, journal publishers, and of course, researchers and resource developers. So what does Fair Sharon actually do? I sort of gave you an overview, but let's talk a little bit about the metadata, the information about those resources and the relationships, the connections between them. Here's an example using the Dryad record, which is a generalist repository. We have a variety of ways in which we engage with other registries that provide important information and also ways in which we describe our records ourselves. So first of all, we use DOIs as minted by Datasite for each one of our records. So we have persistent globally resolvable identifiers for each of our objects in our registry. Oh, just taking a second to load that. What in the world happened there? Oh, and we're back. <laughs> we also have uh, ORCIDs, 
We have ORCIDs linked to all of our maintainers who have provided one. We also have ORCIDs linked to all of our community champions, which are shown at the bottom. And that allows us to unambiguously identify all of the, all of the uh, researchers and research support roles that come to fair sharing and engage with our community in a, um, in a persistent and an unambiguous way. I'll talk more about the ORCIDs later. Oh, I think it must just be my internet is a little slow, but we've got also ROAR. So ROAR is about um, persistent identifiers for organizations. So these are also included on any of our organizational um, information about people who maintain, organizations who maintain a resource or fund a resource. We provide persistent identifiers for those organizations where they exist. We also have a number of other relationships, which I'm not gonna go into here. We have over 40 metadata descriptors, not all of which are required. Indeed, most of them are, are optional. It's just about making sure that each resource can identify the way they wish to identify. So they, we have lots of different ways in which they can provide information about themselves. If we move on to the relationships at the bottom of a record, we've moved from Dryad into a Kemble record, which is a, a database, a chemistry database. And they have a lot of standards that they align with. If you look at their uh, the, the right-hand side of the slide, you see that there are 18 standards they integrate with and 19 databases that either take data from them or share data or, or related to them in some way. So we can look at those relationships either through a searchable list, as I've shown here, and I've just highlighted Brenda so I can show you where it is in the next slide, or we can click on the View Relation Graph button and that gives us a uh, view of all of these relationships in a graphical way. And what that does is it allows you to see not just the relationships from Kimball to those 40-ish resources, but also the relationships they have between them, okay? And so there's Brenda, it, don't worry about the details. I'm not going to quiz you on the contents of the Kimball relationship graph just to say that it is zoomable, it is clickable, and so you can navigate this research landscape yourself, and you can navigate from one record to the next in fair sharing and learn about uh, what, what resources are related to Kimball. We also track the evolution. So a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of databases and standards go out of use sometimes because they lose funding, sometimes because uh, the people involved go to other projects. And we don't just delete the records then, we keep track of the entire life cycle. So we have ready or deprecated. We also have in development and uncertain. We try to limit the number of uncertain records we have because that's like a temporary transitory uh, life cycle status. And at the moment, out of our 4,000 records, and this is where it's really quite interesting because it is a significant number, 530 of them are deprecated. And so what that's telling you is in research, there's a lot of churn uh, for databases, for standards. And so having a resource like fair sharing is vital because you might read a paper and think this ontology is just right for me, but then you can't find it anywhere. But if you look, in fair sharing to try to find related ontologies to uh, in a similar domain, for example, or similar subject area, you can find out, first of all, that it is really deprecated, or maybe it's just had its homepage changed. And so you can come to fair sharing and find where it is now. And we do lots of things with our deprecated records. Let me just see if I can show it click through, I seem to have lost the ability to click. Ah, it was just going slowly. <laughs> so we deprecate a record when a resource has been retired, when it's been superseded by a new version of a resource, and also when a, a resource was added by mistake. Because we have DOIs, we can't just delete a record with a DOI. We tombstone it according to best practices by data site, our DOI provider, and we provide information that there was the record was added in error, but that's we're only we only tombstone a DOI when the resource is actually added and it should never have been added. At all other times, it's just marked as deprecated. I wanted to spend a few minutes now that I've shown you some records just talking about the ORCID registry because this is a really great example of how our relationship graphs work. So don't again, these are this is a, um, a high level overview. Don't worry about trying to read all of the different aspects of 
this record or its relationship graph. I've put the link to it at the bottom of the page and you can click through or you can search for ORCID on fair sharing and find this yourself. So you'll be able to spend more time looking at all the information it has uh, later on. So uh, what, what we're describing here is the registry of ORCIDs themselves. So the database that stores all of the different researchers who have, um, who have logged in and created an account with ORCID. And the relationship graph on the right shows you just how common it is for ORCIDs to be used in other databases. And indeed, even in other um, standards. So there'll be some standards that say you should be using ORCID and in which case we'll have a relationship there. So it gives you an idea of just how connected uh, ORCIDs are within the research data landscape. We have a blog post from a year or two ago when fair sharing became an, um, trusted, a trusted source with ORCID. And that allows us also to push information for our user community where appropriate directly to their ORCID profile when they've done um, volunteering work with us. So all of our community champions get their volunteer and service uh, with us added to their ORCID profile once per year. We also have the ORCID identifier schema. So this is a separate record because remember we have records for databases, which was the ORCID registry. We also have records for standards. In this case, what we're doing here is we're describing the schema itself, the, the way an ORCID uh, identifier looks and the context in which it is placed. So here there are fewer items in the relationship graph because the vast majority of resources interact with the registry. Yes, they pull information about researchers from the registry. They don't interact with the ID schema itself, but there are still a few who do. And it's really important and interesting to look at these things. So like there are other schemas that um, interact with that schema. So to check and make sure that that ORCIDs they've been provided with are correct and things like that. So the next thing I want to talk about is, is how you can search and find things. And there are two ways. There's our main site and there's our assistant, which is in development and is going undergoing active change. But we do, we would like you to engage with it and let us know mainly what you'd like it to do differently because we're in the middle of, we've gained a first round of feedback with our community champions and our board members. And we're going to be spending the next few months um, implementing their suggestions, but we're always happy to have more, uh, more suggestions. Um, right now, people are finding it a little hard to read all the questions that we've got in there. So we're gonna implement a one question at a time route, which should make things a lot easier. But as you, what the point of the assistant is, is it's to provide guidance to get you to those standards databases and policies without having to know the details of how fair sharing works. You just asked a few questions and then you'll be given a set of records that you can, that you can, a smaller set of records that you can review and choose from. As part of this, um, I wanted to show you the search for African resources. You just type the word Africa into the search box at the top of fair sharing. And you'll get, I think at the moment, it's something like 39 resources. I've put them all here. I wouldn't normally put a load of URLs on a slide, but I thought it was worthwhile just showing you uh, a little bit about uh, where they fall within our three different registries. Some of them are um, deprecated and, so, and you can also filter out to just show anything that isn't deprecated later on. That's one of the things that you can do in our search, uh, our search filters. And I thought I'd show you an example of each of the different types. So one of the databases we've got is this Moroccan genetic disease database. And you can see this, it, it's got subjects, it's got domains that so it tells you it's in biomedical science. It tells you it deals with genetic polymorphism and GWAS studies and uh, mutation. It also gives you a taxonomic range, tells you this is only for humans. If we look at a policy record, when it loads, there we are. Oh no, I did the standard first. I did it in a different order than the URLs. Isn't that fantastic? So I did the standard first. Um, this is a minimal information uh, format for, ooh, for earth and environmental sciences with drones. Who doesn't like drones? I mean, that's pretty fantastic all on its own. And then for the policy we have that I put as an example, just waiting for it to load. 
Ah, yes, we've got the African Academy of Sciences Open Research Data Guidelines for Authors. And so this links you to their data guidelines. It, it gives you some information about it, and it shows you the recommendations that those guidelines have for standards and databases. So how do we support repository developers like Africa Archive and others um, like research supporting organizations? Well, we do this, again, try to make their, their resources more visible. Our entire goal is to connect your resources with the researchers and librarians and data stewards who need to use them. And also, we want to give those developers and organizations uh, the ability to collect resources relevant to them and showcase that collection. And so we allow anyone who has an account with us to create slices of fair sharing. We generally want them to be linked to a project, an organization, or a resource, and had to have a page that describes why these slices of fair sharing are relevant to their community. In future, we'll, be, we'll allow every user to save searches, and that will be a user level, almost like a user level live collection. But these, um, these stable collections that get URLs and are maintained are intended to be of benefit to the wider community. So let's talk about those organizations first. Um, organizations are first class citizens in fair sharing. So that means that they get their own pages and that those, those organizational pages will show all of the resources that are linked to that organization. And that includes links through funding, through maintenance, through collaborations and more. We also have the ability for organizations to list members. So if you are a user in fair sharing, you can optionally choose to link your user account to an organization and then that will show up on the organization pages. Uh, on the right, there's a user profile for one of our community champions and it shows that he's linked to the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. Moving from organizations into those slices of fair sharing. So these are collections. They're tailored views of fair sharing for education of your community and promotion within your community. And they're branded pages, branded for you, that group selected standards or repositories. Um, and there's a number of reasons why you might do this. To list resources that are developed by your community, for example, the astronomy one on the top left, for those that are recommended by a community, for example, the output of a working group from the Research Data Alliance on the top right. We can also have uh, organizations who wish to list resources that are developed within that organization, like the CDISC set. And also, um, if people are creating crosswalks, and this has been a popular thing over the last few years to create manuscripts and publications that do crosswalks among standards, then you might want to have a single location where you can list all those resources you're performing the crosswalk for. Collections also get their own graphs, just like every other record type in fair sharing. And here's a, a couple of collections. On the left is the astronomy collection that I showed you earlier. And you can really see how, how each set of standards that are related to each other have bunched up and are then connected to another node of standards. The one on the right is a much more of a hairball. It's got over a hundred resources that are um, developed and used within the European Open Science Cloud's life science infrastructure. Collections are also used as part of standards development organizations or, or even uh, just um, professional organizations um, endorsement workflows. So this, the INCF is a neuroscience community and they wrote a guest blog post for us a few months back about how they use fair sharing to discover new neuroscience standards. Then they evaluate them according to their own workflow. And if approved, they add them to their own INCF collection and fair sharing to show that they are now one of the neuroscience standards that the INCF, INCF approves or endorses. So fair sharing, I've talked a lot about what the records look like and how you can collect them into your own view, but let's just take one or two slides on how you create a new record. So when you click add content at the top of any fair sharing page, you're taken to the page on the left, which is our add content page at slash new. 
and it gives you some information about the, the different registries we have. I've already talked to you about databases, standards, and policies, and how we can group them in collections. It allows you to read some basic information about each type to make sure that your resource is in scope for fair sharing. For example, we don't describe software or other tools as individual records. You can link them within database records and things like this. Um, and of course, we don't accept experimental data itself. Research data goes in those resources we're trying to connect, connect you with. And if everything looks good and you're ready to add your record, you just click on the add new record button and you get started. On the right is a link to our Gitbook documentation that describes exactly how to go about updating a record for all the different metadata fields. When you create a new record, and I'll show this on the left first once it appears, you're presented just with a few uh, initial uh, metadata fields. So, and there's only one, two, three, four, four that are required. So you see, even on the very first page, you don't have to put a lot of information in. We do encourage, and we probably will not approve the record until it has more metadata, but it, it tells you that it's really quite easy to get started. Once you've made a record, you're prompted to add a little bit more information. And on the right-hand side is the tabular view of the edit interface for a record. And I've selected the relationship tab, and this is where you add all of those lovely, interesting relationships that your resource would have with other resources. And then just one slide on the machine accessibility of fair sharing metadata. We work with a lot of uh, tool developers to make sure that they can access all this rich metadata that fair sharing has. And it's used in things like data management plan tools. So tools that help you create data management plans like Data Stewardship Wizard. It's used in fair evaluation and assessment tools, which are, which are starting to harmonize around the ways in which they check that a digital object is fair. And a lot of those checks are performed using uh, metadata from, from fair sharing. So fair sharing supports its user community and is supported by it. And I'm pointing you in the direction of this particular infographic that we recently produced. This one's called Fair Sharing in a Nutshell, and you can find it on our slash educational pages. And it really tells you all about our different stakeholders within our user community. Uh, on the left, it tells you who they are and how they interact with us. And on the right, it tells you the benefits of coming to fair sharing, what we can do for you and what you can do for us and the same for producers. So this gives you a little more detail and I'm coming going into today to, to let you know the ways in which we can help. So I wanted to use this opportunity to just summarize what you guys can do with fair sharing. So you can discover resources that are relevant to your domain. You can create resource records if you are the developer of that resource. Even if you're not the developer, you can create records that are missing and then we will contact the maintainers and have them take over ownership of the record. You could volunteer as a community champion if you're an expert in your domain and you want to uh, ensure that your domain is well represented within Fair Sharing to increase its visibility. And that domain can be anything you decide. It can be a domain in terms of a subject area, it can be a domain in terms of a researcher role. You know, you, you could be representing librarians or data stewards or policymakers. It could also be a, a geographical domain. Anything that you want that you feel you have expertise in that you can bring to fair sharing, we're very happy to talk with you about. And you can also highlight fair sharing and its records within your own data policies, data management plans, and other documentation. We also want to know what what is missing from your interactions with fair sharing? What would you like to do that you can't necessarily do? With talking with Africa Archive, we've we've realized that one thing we're really missing is uh, the ability to select entire regions and resources within them. We have the query for Africa, but we want to do more. So one of our tickets that is not yet complete, however, unfortunately, is a map selection of resources by country or countries. And also we have a new advanced search coming in, which will allow you to drill down into every metadata field, depending on what you need. And of course, our ongoing work on the assistant. So we'd love to hear what you'd like, 
what you'd like from the assistant, what kind of decision tree the assistant could provide to help you, and things like this, you and your community. So a final note before I finish, I, I do see I've gone just over half an hour, Joe, but it was just as just an advertisement for the community champions because they're absolutely lovely. And here we bring in ORCID again. And as a trusted partner with ORCID, every, as I said earlier, every community champion gets a, an item within the within their ORCID profile that shows that they are a community champion with us the years they were active and their domain of interest. And there's a lot of information on our blog about community champions. We also regularly tweet and toot on Mastodon about them, but they are domain experts from all over who help do help us do three different things. They curate content, they contribute to our educational material, especially in ways that would help their own community. And also in return, they gain expertise. They, they gain networking with groups of like-minded experts and of course, wherever possible, we try to throw attribution at them so everyone knows what wonderful work they do. Um, in general, ORCID is integrated not just as records within fair sharing, um, but also, as I said here with the, I think, yeah, I meant, I probably meant to remove this because I included it on the previous slide, but also you, I'll just say you can log in with ORCID as well. And this is a picture when it appears. <laughs> <laughs> of me and Debs. Debs is our, one of our community champions for the humanities. And we met at a conference last March in Sweden and it was absolutely fantastic. You can see we're enjoying pastries there because that's what you do at a conference. But it's these opportunities to connect with a whole slew of people from lots of different um, areas of expertise that is really fantastic. And one of the things that she has commented that she's really liked. I'm just changing the page. Oh, yes. So again, a note that champions help with our educational fact sheets. Everyone you see in blue here is already published, and each one is co-authored by one of our champions. And I wanted to just highlight two of those infographics. On the left is what fair sharing can do for researchers, and on the right is just one of the pages about how fair sharing describes databases. So I thought these two might be of particular interest, but we do have other educational infographics on trainers, um, how fair sharing can help trainers and data stewards and librarians. Even though community champions have only been going for a year, they've made 100 new records, they've updated over 250, they've made over 3000 edits, and this is comparable with what the record maintainers have been doing since the start, because of course record maintainers tend to only update one or two records that they are directly responsible for, whereas community community champions can, can um, update any record within their domain of interest. And I wanted to show a picture of them, which is taking a second to load. And after that, all I have left is my thank you slide. So these are our current community champions. And it, we really, we think they're fantastic. And this has only been going for a year and it's going to continue for the foreseeable future as a permanent fixture within fair sharing. So it's been a lot of fun and I just wanted to, to uh, acknowledge them. And finally, um, the thank you slide with the pictures of our operational team there on the right that have finally appeared. That was slightly, there's 35 minutes there, Joe, but hopefully that's all right. And I'm, uh, I'll have a look at all of the chats. Uh, thank you. <laughs>